Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome and good afternoon to you all. I'm Rick Lufkin, chairman of the Cardinal and Gray Society. This is the second in our three-part series of fall programming, a Cardinal and Gray Society look at, at research and learning at MIT. The world keeps spinning. I want to extend an especially warm welcome this afternoon to the members of the Cardinal and Gray Society and to two of our complementary organizations, the Emma Rogers Society and the Catherine Dexter McCormick Society. Let me give you a little background today on just how this particular program came to topic came to be. The idea originated during preparations for the class of 1968's 50th reunion celebrations in 2018, for which I was the reunion chair. My wife, Ruth, suggested we consider program material, which was more outside world focused rather than the traditional us focused programs, which most classes, including ours, have generally put together. She thought this would both uh, broaden the appeal of reunion attendance to, to trailing spouses, mostly women in our class, and provide something with more intellectual heft than the usual purely celebratory activities. Given that the mid-1960s were a time of unusual cultural foment, we had a lot of potential material to work with. One topic stood out from all others, the introduction of the birth control pill. Perhaps the most significant and impactful technological cultural development of the day, the driving influence of Catherine Dexter McCormick, her tireless work promoting gender equality and her longstanding connection to MIT made it seem particularly pertinent and likely of broader interest. During our class's time at MIT, the proportion of women expanded significantly with the completion of McCormick Hall and members of the class spent time personally with Catherine Dexter McCormick when she visited the campus. As we explored the topic generally, we came to more fully recognize the invaluable contribution which Catherine Dexter McCormick herself made to the introduction of the pill through her passion for women's autonomy and her financial resources, her efforts, the assembly of the scientific team, the funding of the research, and the eventual leadership in finding a pharmaceutical company willing to finalize the development and introduction of the product were absolutely essential to its success. We firmly believe that the insight, energy, and commitment to pursue this dream was deeply informed by her gender and by cultural roles at the time. At that time, back in 2018, we were unable to put together a program based on this topic, but the idea has resonated with us ever since as something well worth pursuing. Thus, when Nancy Mims and I were reflecting on fall programming ideas to be developed for Cardinal and Gray, I suggested a program focusing on Catherine Dexter McCormick might be of interest and could allow us to explore the thesis that Catherine Dexter McCormick was the most culturally influential MIT graduate of all time. That's where the idea got started. The rest is history. To introduce our speaker, who will take us through the captivating history of Catherine Dexter McCormick, I will now pass the virtual microphone to Heather Cogdell, class of 1989, co-chair of the Catherine Dexter McCormick Society and a member of the MIT Corporation. Heather? Thank you, Rick. I'm delighted to be here to represent the members of the Catherine Dexter McCormick Society as co-chair and as a KDMS member. It gives me great pleasure to be a part of something that is so important to MIT and to acknowledge the significant role that Catherine Dexter McCormick played in our MIT community and in the nation's history. The generous members of this society share Catherine's commitment to support the future of MIT and making a better world, as you will see in this compelling presentation. I have the privilege to introduce our most talented speaker, Joanne Graziano, who will share exciting and intriguing insights into Catherine Dexter McCormick's tenacity and remarkable work. Joanne Graziano teaches the writing course on MIT history and contemporary experience at the Institute, including se sections on Ellen Swallow Richards, SB 1873, who was the first woman admitted to MIT, and Catherine Dexter McCormick, SB 1904, who is the subject of today's talk. Joanne's research of original source documents at the MIT Museum, in the MIT archives and elsewhere inform her teaching and her writing. At the Harvard Kennedy School under her former married name, she established and maintains a policy forum that brings together senior leaders in government, 
business, and academia. Her work at MIT crosses the boundary of policy and art. She serves as a writing advisor for MIT classes in political science, education policy, STS, and chemistry for non-majors. She also teaches film in the literature section. In 2018, Graziano co-founded the Boston Women's Film Festival in conjunction with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and the Brattle Theater in Cambridge. She serves as the executive director of the BWFF, which aims to champion the underrepresented work of women directors and artists and showcase issues of social political. Her short fiction has appeared in various publications, including Harvard Review and Story Magazine. She holds a master's in literature and creative writing from Harvard University. She is currently at work on a screenplay inspired by the life of Catherine Dexter McCormick. Please join me in welcoming Joanne Graziano. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Heather, and thank you to the Catherine Dexter McCormick Society and the Cardinal and Gray Society and Rick. It is my deep, my, it, it is really my pleasure to be with all of you, all MIT alums today as well. Catherine Dexter McCormick was on the scene for many of the pivotal events of women's history in the 20th century. She was just, she was, she was not just on the scene, she truly was in the scene. She was a catalyst for change. When we went into COVID lockdown after we finished teaching, I set out on a whim to breathe life into her story. The screenplay was inspired by the archival research pro project my students conduct in 21W021, MIT Inside Live, and the personal narratives they write about their own journeys to MIT. I introduced this essay from 1899 to bridge the two assignments. They are to translate the handwriting and I ask them not to Google the author, even if they see a name. They sometimes complain about having to parse handwriting at a time when computers can do that work for them. One year, the group in typical MIT fashion initiated a healthy competition to see who could translate the four page essay faster. The women won. My preparation for the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, how much I had heard about it, how admirable it was said to be, and how thorough and practical the training it afforded. I heard how scientific it was in all ways, even to proclaiming the doctrine of evolution by permitting the survival of only the fittest of its students. Above all, I had heard of its almost insurmountable difficulties. There's some satire in there. In the next pages, the author writes of how extensive studies in Europe lay the groundwork for MIT. Then the student goes meta on the teacher cheekily talking about how the writing in this essay has been keen preparation as well. The instructor, most likely a man, is not amused and gives, gives her a P minus, admires her margins and says she quite misunderstood the assignment. I go on to tell the class something about the individual who wrote this essay. The first year we did this assignment, one student said, there should be a movie about her life. What follows is not the movie, but the history that inspired it. Catherine Dexter McCormick did not misunderstand the assignment for her life. Catherine Dexter was born into a prominent Chicago family in 1875. Her great grandfather, Samuel Dexter, served in the cabinets of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Her father, Wirt Dexter, was a prominent attorney well known for his philanthropy. After the Great Fire of 1871, he became a senior leader of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society with responsibilities for allocating millions of dollars worth of assistance, coal, mattresses, food, and lumber to fire victims. He dies at 57 of an apparent heart attack. Catherine is 14 years old. Her mother, Josephine, with ties to Springfield, moves her two children to Boston. Her brother, Samuel, attends, graduates Harvard College and goes on to Harvard Law School. In 1894, while attending HLS, Samuel dies from spinal meningitis. Having seen the two most important men in her life succ succumb to illness, Catherine Dexter chooses to apply her intelligence to the study of medicine on a course of study that today we call pre-med, pursuing a bachelor's degree in biology. 
In 1899, Catherine Dexter matriculates at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at the age of 23, after three years as a special student, not unusual for female students at the time. The campus of the relatively new institute is located in Boston. And but judging by this clip art from the 1904 Technique Yearbook, you might think the ratio of women to men is one to four. Catherine Dexter is one of six women in her graduating class of 254. Her handwritten notebooks contain information about human anatomy and medicine, the thyroid gland, the inner ear, and the electrical patterns of dreams. At the time, women are expected to wear hats in class because of Victorian rules about modesty. While at MIT, she argues successfully to change the rule on the grounds that hats are dangerous, that they can catch fire in laboratory. There may be a lab fire in this movie. The tenacious ad advocacy on behalf of women still show up over and over again throughout her life, and she won't give up her love of hats, as you'll see. In 1904, she graduates from M MIT with a BS in biology, one of only three majors and the first woman. Her senior thesis, fatigue of cardiac muscles in reptiles may well have been driven by inquiry into the cause of her father's death. Her intention is to become a surgeon. I believe two experiences sideline that trajectory. While at MIT, she had become reacquainted with a charming member of her Chicago social circle, Stanley McCormick. They attended the same dance school as, as teens. Stanley's father, Cyrus McCormick, built the International Harvester Company after patenting the machine in 1834. After the Great Fire, at the insistence of his wife, Cyrus put his effort into rebuilding the company while the McCormick family remained busy with philanthropy. Stanley, the youngest heir, is appointed comptroller after attending Princeton and Northwestern Law School. In September 1904, not long after graduation, Catherine and Stanley are married in Geneva and begin a newlywed life. Perhaps her medical school trajectory is on hold as they travel extensively through Europe and purchase another residence in Washington, DC. Not long after their marriage, Stanley begins exhibiting peculiar signs of mental instability. In 1906, he is admitted to McLean Hospital in Belmont, Mass for disturbing behavior indicative of a mental disorder at the time labeled dementia precox. Stanley's family insists on moving him to Riven Rock in Santa Barbara. Ironically, he had overseen the building of this estate to house his mentally ill older sister, Mary Virginia, who had subsequently been moved to an institution in Georgia. In 1909, Stanley is declared legally incompetent and his young wife, Catherine, shares responsibility for his care with his siblings, Anita and Harold. She applies her belief in medical science and scientific dis discovery fostered at MIT to his care, funding research on his behalf throughout her life. And here's where other events steer her from that path of becoming a doctor. The women's suffrage movement needs her. While overseeing Stanley's care in concert with his family as a young woman in her thirties, Catherine Dexter McCormick becomes heartily involved in the efforts to bring women the vote. She is pictured here on the right in 1913. She joins MIT alumni and other women from the Boston area in spearheading local and national efforts to enfranchise women. She likely would have joined the College Equal Suffrage League while at MIT that had been founded by women activists at Radcliffe College. There were a host of local organizations representing groups of women from various social, socioeconomic backgrounds. Florence Luscombe, architecture major from Lowell, graduate of the class of 1909, served as executive secretary of Boston's progressive pro-immigrant group, BSAG. Catherine Dexter McCormick held a leadership position in Massachusetts Women's Suffrage, Suffrage Association, MWSA. The two organizations shared the same downtown Boston office building. Florence is seen here on the corner of Boston and Tremont streets in 1909 hawking the women's journal, the MWSA publication made possible through funds from, you guessed it, Catherine Dexter McCormick. BSAG adopted tactics used by British suffragists demonstrating in public sp spaces, a radical move as women were expected only to speak indoors. They traveled across the region on trolley tours giving speeches in support of women's rights to vote. In 1908, Catherine Dexter McCormick joins Luscombe and others on these speaking junkets. In two months, they stopped at three towns a day, 
reaching 25,000 individuals through 97 speeches. Catherine writes to Stanley, it's one long scra scramble with hardly a moment anywhere for so much as fresh washing or a shampoo. She gives one of those public addresses on Nantasket Beach. While she is speaking, the police arrive. Catherine wades into the ocean to continue her speech with the water rising to her knees. Here we see her at a rally in Chicago, stomping for women's rights. She continues these, at, at, these activities while rising to prominence in NASA, the National American Women's Suffrage Association and its international sister org, where she meets Carrie Chapman Catt. Her MIT education no doubt serves her well in these positions. She applies her math and economic skills and or organization, organizational acumen honed at MIT into managing such important national organizations. In a 1911 leadership speech, she exclaims, the cause of suffrage is more valuable to the individual woman than she is to the cause. The reason is that this move movement has the great, though silent force of evolution, there's evolution again, behind it. To come into contact with this movement means to some individuals to enter a larger world of thought than they thought they had known before. To others, it means approaching the same world in a more real and effective way. To all, it gives a wider horizon in the recognition of one fact, that the broadest human aims and the highest human ideals are an integral part of the lives of women. Here we see her along with Kat in Berlin, 1913. She's the second from the right. Here at the assemblage of the NASA leadership in Washington, DC, she's the first standing woman with the arrow above her head. She serves as the association's treasurer in 1914, she is elected vice president. After the ratification of the 19th amendment, she co-founds the League for Women's Voters with Kat. Her scientific credentials must also factor into her appointment in the Wilson administration as chair of the Department of Food Production and Home Economics of the Women's Committee of the Council of National Defense. In 1922, she writes an op-ed for the woman's leader in London calling for the end of warfare. While attending to matters of national importance, Catherine remains deeply committed to the care of her husband who has been under doctor supervision at Riven Rock. She had become convinced that Stanley's dementia precox was the result of a defective adrenal gland leading to a hormonal imbalance in his brain. Catherine gives a grant to Harvard Medical School to fund the Neuroendocrine Research Foundation in 1927, originally, and originally names it for her husband, as well as funding the care of patients at Worcester State Hospital, perhaps in hopes that research would uncover some aid for Stanley. With the rise in Freudian practices, she hires a new medical team, stipulating that they take a hybrid approach. Stipulating is the right word here because throughout her life, she is a stipulator. The doctors are to introduce some Freudian psychoanalysis while continuing to in investigate the physiological roots of Stanley's illness. Doctors White and Kempf ignore her directive, promoting only talk therapy. When she moves to not renew their contract, she learns the family has already extended it. In 1928, she and the family become embroiled in a lawsuit over custody of Stanley's care a case that makes national sensational headlines during the Great Depression. She petitions the court for sole guardianship of her husband. One can posit the fight with the family being motivated by some concerns about inheritance as well. By March, 1930, she wins the case to have White and Kent ousted, but is not granted sole guardianship. The court adds the deans of the medical schools of UCLA and Stanford to his care team. Much to Catherine's chagrin, they do not heed her desire to try some form of hormonal imbalance treatment on her husband. She claims it is in their financial best interest to maintain his care indefinitely and thus not seek a cure. Stanley McCormick succumbs to pneumonia in 1947. His illness, now known as schizophrenia, has since been found to be deeply rooted in chemical imbalances in the brain. This portrait which many of you may recognize, was painted in 1910. The photograph beside it from the MIT Museum is likely from an earlier time outside her home on Commonwealth Avenue. When Stanley McCormick dies in 1947, as his sole beneficiary, Catherine Dexter McCormick stands to inherit $40 million. She is 71 years old. Once the dust settles over the disposition of Stanley's estate, she continues her philanthropic efforts and ever the scientist turns her attention to research concerned with limiting reproduction, birth control. 
she will live to be 92. Nurse Margaret Sanger coined the term birth control in 1914, establishing the first of her Planned Parent clinics in 1916 in Brooklyn. McCormick meets Margaret Sanger at a suffragist related event in 1917, when the New Yorker comes to Boston for the trial of a young man who had been distributing contraceptive pamphlets. This next story is anecdotal, but I have seen it in every account of McCormick's life. Not long after meeting Sanger in the 1920s in the ultimate MIT hack, McCormick helps procure contraceptive devices for distribution in Sanger's clinics. Traveling regularly to Europe where contraception is legal, Catherine Dexter McCormick arranges to have hundreds of diaphragms sewn into the hems of dresses and smuggles them into the country in trucks for Sanger to distribute in her clinics under the guise of medical necessity. She is rumored to have been ready to claim that American women just loved fashions if questions about the sheer quantities when entering the country. In 1948, Sanger, no longer a leader of Planned Parenthood, inquires about McCormick's ability to put resources behind birth control efforts. McCormick is funding Planned Parenthood initiatives, but they are not demonstrating progress. She lets Sanger know that her husband's estate needs to be settled and the inheritance tax sorted before she can take, make any commitment. By November, 1950, McCormick, still unable to commit her resources, states, I have long wished to be of more constructive assistance to the birth control movement, especially along the lines of contraceptive research. On June 8th, 1953, Sanger introduces McCormick to Gregory Pincus, who has been conducting research with synthetic, progester with synthetic progesterone on rabbits and rats in his laboratory in Shrewsbury, the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Bi Biology. He has been able to stop ovulation. While his initial re research has been funded by Planned Plan Parenthood, they decided to stop supporting him, considering his research risky with faith in science and a desire to see an oral contraceptive become a reality, Catherine Dexter McCormick provides him with $20,000 immediately after this encounter. And within a week, provides him with another infusion of the same amount. Knowing that the progesterone pro protocol will work, Pincus will need a medical doctor to conduct human trials and he enlists the, his acquaintance, Dr. John Rock from the Harvard Medical School. Rock has been similarly using progesterone to give infertile women a chance to reboot their systems by shutting down their ovulation for a few months. Rock conducts the initial birth control trials on the sample set from Boston in his fertility clinic, establishing the 21 day on one week off regimen suggested by Pincus that we use to this day. And McCormick in her letters to Sanger expresses satisfaction, but knows there is more work to be done to bring the project full circle. She takes an active role in the oversight of their research as she continues to infuse the Worcester Foundation and Rock with the funding they need to conduct vital research. In the summer of 1954, while in Boston, in her letters and Western Union telegrams, she characterized Pincus, characterizes Pincus as inspirational and Rock as the practical doctor. She urges Rock to keep her apprised of the science of their work and admits to Sanger that she cannot count on eccentric Pincus to regularly update her but she does believe in the work that both are doing in concert. They need to find somewhere to conduct a larger scale clinical trial. Margaret Sanger suggests Japan or Honolulu. Pincus and Rock talk to Mark McCormick about their conclusions of the advantages of conducting the trust in nearby Puerto Rico, despite the language barriers. In 1956, Rock and Pincus choose Searle to manufacture the drug Enovid and oversees scaled human trials in San Juan, Puerto Rico. By today's ethical standards, these trials would have been required a greater amount of information be given to the subjects, but at the time, they passed the bar. Some of the trials caused discomfort and issues. Rock and Pincus realize their trial pills have accidentally been tainted at the manufacturer with estrogen. They conduct more trials without this issue and conclude that the mix is more effective. In an article in Science Magazine in November 1965, Rock reports on research where women have taken oral contraceptives that are effective. In 1957, the FDA approves the use of 10 milligram Enovid for treatment of severe menstrual disorder. And as you can imagine, there is suddenly an uptick in women who seem to be complaining of these issues at their doctor's offices. 
Catherine Dexter McCormick is more than a cheerleader through all this. She is tenacious, pushing to see the research through to its fruition. While I have had access to her digitized letters to Margaret Sanger from this period, there is a collection at the Schlesinger Library that I, ha I have that I hope to peruse after COVID restrictions are lifted. In 1960, the FDA approved Searle's application for the first drug in history to be given to a healthy individual for extended use. Catherine Dexter McCormick is 85 years old. Searle tests lower dosages of 2.5 and 5, 5 milligrams later, and the pill goes through several iterations of other companies coming on board, most notably Ortho Novum. By 1963, 2.3 American women are using the pill. By 1965, that number raises to, rises to 6.5 million. According to the noted historian of women's reproductive rights, Andrea Tone from McGill University, an estimated 80% of women born since 1945 have used the pill. She goes on to say that the major pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer and Merck, had shied away from this research because of the controversies su surrounding reproductive rights. She credits Catherine Dexter McCormick, as Rick did, with single-handedly making the birth control po pill, pill possible. As we all know, Catherine Dexter McCormick goes on to fund the building of MIT's only all-female dormitory, McCormick Hall, dedicated in 1963, which makes possible the admission of considerably more female students to MIT. Many of the alums who have written to me about meeting Mrs. McCormick during this time note how passionately she spoke to them about the pill. I greatly appreciate your stories and hope that more of you will come forward to inform me of all you know about her. For those of you curious about the opening scene of the screenplay, I can assure you that her story begins at MIT. In a nod to the infinite corridor of a slightly later time, we follow a tall feather making its way through a sea of male heads on the way to class. The feather stops at the transom of a chemistry classroom and Catherine Dex Dexter dips her head and enters. Thank you, Joanne. That was an astonishing story and told so succinctly and with clarity. Uh, that was the Catherine Dexter McCormick that I never knew. What I have learned is how to pronounce her name very carefully, so I can say it several times. Thank you. Um, we will now open up the uh, the audience to questions. I'm hoping that uh, uh, people will have something to uh, to to have to specifically ask. I am looking now, and lo and behold, we have a question. Um, why was Dr. Pincus not communicating with KDM? Was it because she was a woman? Did she face sexism in her, in her life as she worked to promote science? Joanne? That's a, that's a great question. I believe a Dr. Pincus himself, I, I, you know, some, what I've read of her letters, um, she doesn't say it's because he's a man. It has more to do with the fact that he's eccentric, as you saw in the picture of him with the bunny rabbit. He's so eccentric that he's not a scientist who normally does. There is a possibility that he did not want to kind of communicate that information to her because she was a woman or she felt he felt kind of browbeaten by her as you know the, as the patron. But honestly, I don't know if it was because he was a man, if that's the reason she wanted, she wasn't, he wasn't informing her. Uh, Sarah asks, did the McCormicks have any children? What about nieces and nephews? You mean, uh, Catherine and Stanley never had any children. And one of the reasons they never had any children was because of Stan Stanley's illness. So they never did have, yeah. a, they did have children. So that's, that's, you know, that was definitely a problem for them and they did not have children. Okay. Uh, Karen asks, how was KDM treated by MIT by her professors and classmates? Well, that's a really interesting <laughs> I see, as you can imagine, being one of if each if each class when she's there has about six to eight women in the class. You can see in the in technique the yearbook. You can actually see some um, uh, cheeky the men kind of. There was there's one comment by the men. Um, the coeds they wonder how they made it through these four years, and we wonder too. I mean, I, I've actually seen that quote. So how were they regarded? Um, questionable. One of the things that uh, I think Deb Douglas at the MIT Museum would probably say about that photo that I that that sketch I showed you from Technique is that um, that sketch of showing a woman there was really to sell MIT to men. 
I mean, that's true. <laughs> Uh, you know, and this, the, the part of the screenplay I've written so far goes all the way through her time at MIT, and you can see the kind of the what's going on there. But you know, I don't have any correspondence. I actually make in, in the screenplay. She's friends with the other person who graduates in biology, William Lounsbury, even though I don't have any correspondence that she actually did was in that case. Uh, Richard D. asks, why isn't McCormick's role in the suffrage movement and in the birth control pill better known? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. She certainly <laughs> could be. I mean, you know what? It, you know, the fact that she was so active in the suffrage movement, but she preferred, and she definitely said this when it ha happened. What she spoke on behalf of the suffragists, but she really wanted to be in the back, in the in the back room. She wanted to be doing management. She was a treasurer. She was somebody who worked regularly doing organizational work. She did. She ran the economics. She ran the numbers. She th did those kind of things in addition to speaking. She she prepped people to speak. But really, some of her role there was one of those was that back room. And unfortunately, a lot of the people who organize and are in back rooms, they don't get recognized. And I think that's really part of the of the problem there. Uh, Karen asks, can you talk about how she came to make the donation from McCormick Hall? That's a, that's a question that I believe that the, the, the KDMS Society and Rick and the Cardinal and Gray Society definitely could, but I know that she wanted to give back to, to considerably give back to MIT. And the other thing I can say about McCormick Hall is she was quite concerned about the, the low numbers of, of female students who could attend MIT. And the reason so few female students could attend in my MIT is because there wasn't somewhere where they could live yeah. on campus. And so by building McCormick Hall, that allows MIT to recruit more women, to, for, for more women to be admitted to MIT. And it makes a, a very big difference. Yeah, Gail comments, how true is the story that she funded McCormick Hall for women to increase the women at MIT because she was not successful in getting the admissions department to admit more, so. <laughs> Ah, I can know the answer. Okay, so those some of those files. I have to be honest with you. Some of those files in the archive are still closed. They're still under. You know, they're still closed. And I don't know the answer to that question. I wasn't a member of the administration, and I don't have those okay. access to that. But that's uh, a good question. Uh, John asked, "Did she keep a diary?" I do not have access to any diary. But one of the things that she did keep was, which is really curious, she kept all of her notebooks from MIT you know, all through her life and that's why we have them at the at the archive and not everyone keeps them I mean, how many of you you know keep your notebooks from you know your physical maybe from your physics classes I know I did but you know I, I it is kind of a weird thing to do so whether or not she kept a diary or not I, I have not had access to a diary I only retired my MIT notebooks a few years ago. So I do understand her, her motivations. They stick with you. The, the emotional energy you poured into creating them in the first place really makes it very difficult to part with them. Um, Bridget asks, did she write about her experiences at MIT or in her later life? Most of what she's, she's so dedicated to her. I, I don't have any accounts of her writing about her experiences at MIT. She, most of what she's, she's so driven by making sure that the science behind the birth control pill works, that that's really what she's kind of focused on. Okay. And I think Rick will speak to, and she's also, you know, there's a part of her life that I didn't even leave, put in here. And she's a, she's a major philanthropist and she's very busy with that and throughout her life in giving to very worthwhile causes. I mean, you know, I've only touched on points, very small points of her life. Do, do, can you just identify some of the other organizations that she supported philanthropically? I think, uh, I think Bob's going to do some of that. So I, I'm okay. going to. <laughs> okay. Um, why did the, pol uh, Julia asks, why did the police show up at the beach? Is there more on this story you can share? That, that story is an interesting one because um, that's actually, I have, I have it, um, that story actually comes from one of our, um, our MIT students, who, uh, graduate students in science writing who uncovered that story, uh, Anna Natawaski, I hope I'm not slaughtering her last name, but the story, but, but at the time, um, it was, women were not allowed to kind of congregate outside, to, to speak out, outside. 
And I think the police were, you know, trying to sh sh shut down the suffrage oh. movement. And women were not allowed to be speaking outside. That was not permitted. So as a result, you know, when she goes out, when she's out in Nantasket Beach, and again, in Nantasket Beach, she's speaking to it, uh, an audience of like-minded people. You know, that it's, you know, an opera society who's going to Nantasket Beach. And she's out there kind of talking about the women's movement. And suddenly, you know, the police show up because she shouldn't be doing that. That's against what a woman should be doing. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Certainly by today's standards, no, it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, I think of myself as being pretty outspoken. Most of my students are very outspoken. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the, the Catherine Dexter McCormick that I paint during her time at MIT is also outspoken at MIT. Yeah. To be someone who's willing to kind of fight a rule, and I actually, um, I envisioned her taking class with the only female professor at the time who would have been quite elderly by the time, Ellen Swallow Richards, right. or enough. In research that I did, I've uncovered just recently, she actually did take class with which Okay. Uh, Karen asks, I think that I had heard that Jim Killian approached her. I presume that's regarding the funding of uh, McCormick Hall. Um, is that true? Do you know? I believe that is true. But. Okay. Uh, Bob Z asks, is she related to the builders of McCormick Place in Chicago? Um, I do not know the answer to that, but again, McCormick is Stanley's last name, not hers. Yep. She is in Chicago. She is re she is related to all the people who did the any 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 building that's that's got the name Dexter on it. That's definitely the, her. Okay. her. Uh, Sarah asks, didn't Dr. Rock share a Nobel for the pill? That is correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, Alec asks, what percent of MIT undergraduates are now women? Ah, that one I have the answer to. <laughs> thanks to, thanks to the, Rick's wonderful team. 47%, and thanks to Jessica and Bryce for that. 47%. Okay. Uh, Debbie asks, can you give us more details on the, her importation of contraceptive devices or suggest a research resource where we can learn more? That That's, okay, so that story shows up in that same, in, in the same way I tell it, um, in in every kind of story, anecdotal story I've seen about her, but the resources are harder to find. Um, there is a piece in the tech by Gen Genevieve Wanucha that kind of re references that as well. Everyone talks about that. And apparently I've been told that the, that the trunks for the smuggling actually uh, were kept in basement of McCormick Hall for a while, you know, as a museum piece. So I do know that I know I I'm looking for that information because I, I am curious again I'm writing a screenplay so that's a little yeah. I take creative license but it's it, there's no creative license in the fact that she had those sewn in you know did you know did she did she speak you know I've seen uh, uh, accounts where they actually talk about her kind of posing as a scientist to be able to, to purchase that many <laughs> devices and I can also tell you that Margaret Sanger's husband helped smuggle in through his oil drums helped smuggle those in as well. And once he starts doing that, she's not doing that any longer. Catherine isn't doing that. Uh, John asks, how large was her estate at the age of 92? Did she have heirs or did it all go to philanthropy? She did not have heirs because, uh, and, and, and again, a lot of that is closed um, and, and private information that some of which the MIT corporation has, has copies of because of her bequests. So I, you know, I'm not at liberty to say to say what those numbers are, but I and I again I, I don't have access to those numbers, and and again it didn't really inform my my work, so I'm I'm sorry about that. I don't have an answer to that, but she did not. Her heirs would have been you know extended family members, but again they didn't have any children. Hmm. Uh, Karen S uh, points out that she too has her MIT notebooks, notebooks, and so do, so do many classmates. I think we are all of a mind in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> my my undergraduate for a very long time and kept saying to me, when are you going to take these back? Uh, Karen also asks, has she been had she been involved with MIT after her graduation? Did she have any involvement with the institute? You know, in the years following her graduation, or did it wait until the many years later? I believe that because she was so involved with it, she's she's involved with the alumni who are all connected to the women's suffrage movement, like mm -hmm. Florence. Um, you know, uh. there are women who she shows that there's that connection to MIT right there. She is very involved with Stanley's kind of it, Stanley's care. And 
you know, she is involved with Harvard because of the endocrine research that she's funding. And am I not doing that kind of work at the time? So I don't know if she was kind of connected, stayed connected to the Institute. I know she, she felt very strongly about the Institute. That those, that those sentiments you see, you know, as of a young woman talking about the MIT and how we're gonna kind of, it's kind of idealistic in a way, the same way my students pieces, um, you know, she that she she comes back to MIT in 1963 because she believes in that because she believes it's a place where yeah. women be. She's really strong about women being work, working in science. She comes to MIT oh. after all. She doesn't go to Harvard where they have the Lawrence School at the time. She chooses MIT. Okay, uh, Neil points out. I'm fairly start, certain the smuggling smuggling diaphragm story is correct. From 1920 to 1926, she traveled to Europe, always returning between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Busy times at customs to try to check all her trunks and gowns. Best regards from Santa Barbara. <laughs> Neil calls from Santa Barbara. <laughs> um, George asks, "What happens to the remainder of her estate after her death?" I think. Um, Again, that in the, there's disposition in many places to many or, many philanthropic or, organizations. I, I didn't come prepared to say that, but again, some of that is still kind of under wraps. Okay, uh, Robert um, points out Ellen Swallow Richards was never made a professor by MIT. She was only an instructor. MIT never let her pursue a PhD. She did receive an honorary PhD from another university. Ah, uh, yes. So in chemistry 5310, I can tell you that we actually, the students to this day still do one of the, one of the labs that Ellen Swallow Richards started. The, uh, a, 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 and the students go out and test the water of the Charles River. I mean, of course they're doing it in a more modern way, but Ellen Swallow Richards goes on to become an incredibly important individual for Massachusetts and for home, she's the founder of home economics and not the 1950s thing we call, you know, the thing we call home economics. <laughs> She's home and sanit sanitation. She's, she's not that regarded. The way she shows up, she shows up in the screenplay and I, you can see that she's not as regarded as she should be. Uh, PJ comments, I was the first group to live in McCormick Hall. I was outraged that I was required to live there. So I la laminated my sign out card and rented an apartment. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one, PJ. That's a great point. I mean, that's a really interesting point. I mean, the fact that if, you, if as a woman, you can only come to MIT if you can live somewhere yeah. it, that MIT will allow you to live. Uh, Priscilla points out, she paid for taxis for women students from the freshman dorm on Bay State Road in 1961. Now, there's a factoid that i uh, not heard before. <laughs> um, an, an anonymous attendee writes as follows. In 1959, I got a letter from MIT saying they could only admit 10 women because all first year students had to live on campus and they did not have enough beds for women. Actually, there was a special dorm in Boston for women not on campus. Also, McCormick Hall gave a second grant to MIT for an annex. Also, McC McCormick gave a second grant to MIT for an annex to McCormick Hall, I believe in her will. Soon after, the, the rule for women living on campus was rescinded. Oh, the story continues. Um, Ruth asks, you started this account with a wonderfully illustrative uh, letter evocative of her attitudes and thinking about admission to MIT. How did that letter come to your attention originally? Oh. That, that letter is actually uh, is, is actually part of the archives, uh, the MIT, that is in the uh, okay. MIT collections. Our archivist brought it to our attention. And the professor who founded this class, Lucy Marx, um, daughter of Professor Leo Marx, the founder of Science, Technology, and Society, actually brought it to my attention. And that's how it came to me. And I have a funny anecdote about that because when my students, you saw a picture of my students going to the archives, one of those visits to the archives, that letter was passed around to all the students to, for all the students to see the actual letter, not the introduction that we usually work from. And when class was over, I was on my way on a trip to Washington and I packed up my bag and I left. And then when I got to Washington, I realized I was carrying Catherine Dexter McCormick and I had to call the archivist and he was very, very nervous. <laughs> that um, I've never told you before, but it's back in the archives where it belongs. Um, Susan uh, observes, I'm pretty sure that most of Mrs. McCormick's estate was given to MIT, and I think it was the largest such gift to MIT at the time. 
That is correct. It, yeah, but uh, a big part of that is true. It is the largest of family yeah. too. Uh, Susan, another Susan says, there are essays by KDM as a student, one sardonically commenting on, commenting on the attitudes she encountered as a student in her education. One was posted on the wall in the library at MIT some years ago. <laughs> uh, that's probably for the KDM e uh, exhibit that was put together by Professor uh, Mary Resnick for the, for the, um, for the anniversary of, of McCormick Hall. Um, I'm indebted to Professor Resnick and her research. She really has done phenomenal research on Hmm. Uh, Hillary points out, is there any information about her high school years and how she became a science nerd? That one I don't know the answer to yet, but I am very curious. People ask me all the time, why did she wind up at MIT? How did that happen? How nerdy was she? I've seen photographs of her being incredibly studious. She's got books. Some of them are staged, but she's always reading. She's reading constantly. We have a whole collection in the MIT museum that has just been digitized of her reading, 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 nerding, nerding, nerding. <laughs> uh, Karen uh, points out that the recent, a uh, Mary Frances Wagley, class of 1947, who was the first woman in the MIT corporation, recently passed away. Uh, just another uh, factoid. Um, Susan uh, points out, complaints about being forced to live in McCormick is funny, considering the lack of such dorm space prevented many women from attending at all. Yeah, right. that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you could be upset that kind of MIT is making that requirement that women have, to, there has to be a place for them to live yeah. to do that. If you've never seen the movie, The Social Beaver, it says something very strange about the way women are regarded in the 50s at MIT. Uh, Kay asks, did she have any personal investments in any of the pharmaceutical companies involved in the, on QCs, presumably in the birth control pill? Personal yeah. investments? That's a, that's a good question. Again, um, that's one that, that, that's, that is in, that I suspect is in that um, correspondence mm. between Pincus and she that is at the Schlesinger Library. I haven't had access to that yeah. because of COVID restrictions. Those are not digitized. I do plan to be looking into that, but I don't believe, I, you know, it's hard to tell there, you know, Pincus had been working with Searle for, for quite some time. And he's the one who originally suggests that Searle be the one they work with. Okay. There's another company she actually talks about chemistry that they, they've, because they're looking for the most cost effective as well as the one that can do the manufacturing quick, quickly enough. Yeah. Uh, Sharon points out, there are many delightful stories related to discussions between current undergraduate women and Mrs. McCormick about the design of McCormick Hall. Hmm. Those are uh, Pat, um, 20 plus women entered in 1959. Three of us lived at Women's House on the Fenway, roughly the same percentage of women as when KDM was there. Uh, not much change between 1899 and 1959. In 1953, there was actually, there was a concern that so few women were completing at MIT, like one and 1.3% 1, 1 of, of graduates of MIT were female. There was such a concern that they, M, M, the administration actually for a very slight amount of time considered, go, you know, not no longer offering co-ed education. I mean, wow. contribution is so important. It's very important. Yeah. Uh, William S. points out, I think of MIT as venerating the hard sciences of physics, chemistry, and electrical engineering. What place did the life sciences have at MIT in the early 20th century? Remember, the life sciences are just, uh, uh, just beginning. You know, if Catherine, if Catherine Dexter McCormick had gone, to, gone to, you know, to Harvard, to the Lawrence School, she probably would have been able to study more of those sciences than, than at MIT. Mm. But in the same sense, that idea of the hands-on education that MIT was doing, you know, that mind and man, the mind and hand is really what she was more interested in. And that's why, I mean, you saw what her thesis was about. I, I was fascinated to see that she had been working with reptile, reptiles and cardiac arrest in reptiles at, in 1903. Fascinating. Wow. Okay, we are just about running out of time. I'm gonna throw one more question at you from Karen. Do you have any idea of how her family felt about her going to MIT and how her, and, uh, how her, fa fa her family and the McCormick family felt about her charitable activities? I, 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 you know, again, I don't know about her charitable. I know that her mother was at, just like her father, a, a huge proponent of philanthropy and of the arts. And I can also tell you that her parents really were backed 
education. So the idea that she was going to MIT, MIT was, you know, that's where she wanted to go. I mean, I, I believe that they were, she was, her mother was behind it all the way. That's my understanding is that her mother thought that was a great idea. That's where she wanted to go. I haven't seen anything, you know, from back there that she might have considered one of the other schools. Maybe she didn't chose not to go to Harvard because of what had happened to her brother, but I, yeah. or one of the other schools, but she didn't go to, you know, she, she wanted to go to a school where she could learn something technological wow. and I don't know the answer to that, to, to who, how the family felt. Wow. Joanne, thank you. Okay. One of the, the one of the, one of the sincerest indi indications of a wonderful talk is that I still have bunches of, uh, of questions to ask. However, uh, time is, uh, is uh, not always friendly. And I'm going to pass the baton now to Bob Johnson uh, for some closing remarks and to thank you more formally. Uh, Bob Johnson is also the co another co-chair of the Catherine Dexter McCormick Society and a life member emeritus of the MIT Corporation. Uh, Bob, you are on. Thanks, Rick. Um, excuse me, my wife is uh, running the printer at just the wrong time. Um, thank you so much, Joanne. This this was just really terrific, and I can't uh, can't wait for the movie. Um, some of you may know I happen to live in Santa Barbara, and uh, as a result, have gotten a little bit more exposed to Catherine Dexter McCormick. And I just wanted to mention a few a few little things. Uh, relative to that. She was a great supporter of Santa Barbara. She provided tremendous support to getting the um, Santa Barbara Museum of Art started and, and uh, on its feet, including donating major works, uh, including uh, three Monet landscapes. She also gave the museum several major properties that she owned in Santa Barbara. Um, <clears throat> but her arts, her support of the arts extended far beyond Santa Barbara, as an example. Every December, she would sit down with the chairman of the board of the Boston Symphony to find out what the deficit was that year. And then she would write a check to cover it. It's in honor of, of Catherine's broad philanthropic spirit that the uh, Catherine Dexter McCormick Society was founded, KDMS for short. Some of you may have attended the KDMS uh, annual brunch in September. I had the honor then of making a, a few closing comments. And I want to re repeat a few of those thoughts uh, to this broader audience today. I think we all agree that the last nine months have been brutal and it's not over. We are reminded again that mother nature is in charge of the world, living and inanimate, the entire planet. Our ability to survive and thrive as a species absolutely depends on developing an intelligent, realistic understanding of the physical and biological worlds that we live in. We are plundering the only planet we have, both physically and biologically. And we can already see how fragile the balances are in both domains. This is due to a lot of problems at many levels. Many, many people around the world are living at or near subsistence levels. And too many businesses and governments worldwide have short time horizons. A short-term mindset dominates today. Many people do not listen to the predictions of an unpleasant, inconvenient, dangerous future. At best, they think it is too far away to worry about now. As a result, our research-based university system is under attack. It's losing respect, losing influence, losing support. It's inconvenient and unwelcome messages are attacked or worse, ignored. The world needs MIT now more than it ever has to understand what is really happening and to determine what must be done. And it's people like us, the alumni of the great research universities who understand why these universities must be kept strong. And it's our support that will be critical to mankind figuring out how to live in equilibrium with the planet Earth and with each other. I wanna give you a specific example as to why alumni support is so necessary. There are many philanthropies and institutions that support research and development, even curiosity-driven research with no apparent payoff. But most, including the sophisticated big ones, provide only partial support. They won't pay for overhead. That's like going to a restaurant paying for the ingredients, the cooks and the waiters, 
but not for the dishwashers, the rent, the heat, and electricity. And why is that? I don't know, but that's what they do, and they have done it for years. So while philanthropies do support research, universities have to reach into their own pockets to cover the overhead. And this is called under recovery. And this is where we alumni come in. Supporting any part of MIT helps MIT to handle under recovery. After all, money is fungible. Support from us for whatever part of MIT we choose to support increases the ability to pursue the fundamental unglamorous basic research that is so important without compromising our commitment to providing the best education possible. This is what KDMS is all about. And many members of Cardinal and Gray and Emma Rogers also provide sustained support so that MIT can work to make a better world, a world that will survive and thrive. We are all proud to be alumni of MIT. The opportunity we had to come here was life-changing, a life-changing gift to us. And MIT is a gift to the world. We have to keep its flame alive and burning bright. We must follow in the steps of Catherine Dexter McCormick as she worked so tirelessly in so many ways to make a better world. Thank you all for your steadfast support of MIT and for being here with us today. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.